And now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog Yukon King as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Here's the breakfast that brings cheers from coast to coast. The breakfast that wins praise from many a He-Man Hollywood movie star, too. It's swell-tasting Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat with milk or cream and fruit. These king-size, ready-to-serve premium grains of rice or wheat are shot from guns. Yes, actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender as nuts in November. Tomorrow, sure, try this thrifty deluxe breakfast treat. You'll cheer, too, for Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Sergeant Preston was responsible for the capture of a notorious outlaw named Martin. A week before Martin's trial, the Mountie and his great dog, King, came into Dawson. They stopped first at the office of the newspaper, the Klondike Press, to greet Jim Carvel, the publisher, who was an old friend. Yes, indeed, King. <laughs> Everything I said to your master goes for you, too. <laughs> I'm downright glad to see you. I'm mighty glad. And now, King, you can be quiet. I uh, wondered if you'd get here for the Martin trial. How do things look? I think the conviction is a foregone conclusion. Is Henry Baker defending Martin? Yes. He's smart and crafty. Even so, there's a limit to what an attorney can do. Not even Baker can get an acquittal for Martin. Not with Dave Broderick as a witness. Well, well, look who's here. Constable Drake. How are you? Sergeant Preston, I... oh, I'm mighty glad to see you. Hi there, King. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd be hightailing it in here, Drake. As soon as you saw Preston sled outside my office. Well, frankly, Sergeant, I'm relieved that you got here. I've been hoping from day to day that you'd be in town. What's wrong, Drake? Well, it it's nothing I can put my finger on. I should think you'd be feeling downright chipper. You've got your prisoner behind bars, and a conviction as good as in the back. That's what worries me. Oh? Huh? You mean you don't think Martin will be convicted? I mean, I think that Martin and that shyster lawyer of his, Baker, are scheming some kind of mischief. So that's it. Baker looks altogether too sure of himself to suit me. Hmm. Sergeant Preston was just saying Baker's smart and crafty. He knows the whole case hangs around a single witness. You know who that is? Yes. Dave Broderick. He practically begged me to keep him out of it. I think he's afraid of Martin's friends. Sergeant Preston, if Dave Broderick doesn't come into court next week, that dirty, sneaking murderer will get off scot-free. And there'll be another feather in Baker's cap. Exactly. Where's Baker now? I suppose he's with his client. He's probably talking to Martin and bragging about the fact that he's never lost a case and that he won't lose this one. The law in many parts of the Yukon had tried to get a case against the killer known as Martin, but without success. Now, at last, it seemed as though Martin was about to pay for his crimes, unless his lawyer could do something wholly unexpected. The lawyer, Henry Baker, went to call on his client in the iron-doored cell that opened off the constable's office. I'll have to lock you in the cell with the prisoner, Mr. Baker. Quite all right. Quite all right, my good fellow. I'll let you know when I'm through conferring with Miss Martin. And just yell when you're ready to leave. Thank you. Howdy, Baker. Sit down. Sit down, Martin, and relax. Relax. That's mighty easy for you to say. They don't have you behind bars. Oh, now, you've got nothing to worry about. What about that witness, Dave Broderick? They'll have him in court testifying against me. Broderick can tell plenty. <laughs> He won't talk. If he talks, I'll hang. Martin, you know my reputation. I'm paying you plenty on account of it. I've never let one of my clients hang, and I don't intend that you shall be the first. Now, don't worry about Dave Broderick. Don't worry about a thing. 
After your trial next week, you will walk out of court a free man. After terminating his visit, the lawyer left the building that housed the constable's office and the jail and went directly to the cafe. As he passed through the large, well-filled room, he signaled a swarthy-looking individual who sat alone at a corner table. Blackie Sneed rose and followed the lawyer to a back room. Sit down, Blackie. I got the high sign, Mr. Baker. I figured maybe you wanted to see me. I have a little job for you. <laughs> Good. Cash on the line and no questions asked, eh? That's right. Cash on the line, no questions asked. Let's make out like this here table is the line, huh? Here's some cash in advance. <laughs> There'll be more when the job is done. Now I'm working for you, Mr. Baker. Name it, boss. Do you know where Dave Broderick lives? Yeah. He's got a small shack about two miles north of town. You, uh, want him killed, is that it? Hmm? Where'd you get that idea? He's going to be called in as a witness at the trial next week, isn't he? That's the plan. You can't win against his testimony, and you can't afford to lose. <laughs> You'd spoil your reputation. You see, Baker, I know you better than most people. You wouldn't have called me in here and asked if I knew Broderick <laughs> unless you wanted him out of your way. You're a smart man, Blackie. And I like to do business with a smart man. I want Broderick out of the way. But there must be no suspicion of murder. Maybe you've got ideas? Yes, I have. I'd like to see his house burned down. Tonight. Broderick, of course, to perish in the fire. I see. Now it must be handled so that he doesn't awaken and escape from the fire or catch you in the act of starting it. And keep talking. The contents of this little bottle solve our problem. Put this into his drinking water. Poison? No. No, but it'll guarantee a very deep sleep for several hours. And how am I going to put it into his drinking water? Look, you and I are going to call on David Broderick right now. You can take me to his place in your dog sled. Now, while I'm talking to him, empty this bottle into the drinking water. You can go back there tonight and set fire to the cabin without fear of discovery. <laughs> For this? I'll triple it when the job is done. <laughs> yeah, that's better. I'll hitch up my dogs and be ready to start for Broderick's place in a few minutes. Blackie found it a simple matter to put the sleeping potion into the supply of drinking water while Baker talked to Dave Broderick. The conspirators returned to Dawson. And it was some time later when Sergeant Preston and his great dog, King, went over the same hard-packed trail. Looking! Oh, you have to Find Broderick at home, King. Sergeant Preston. Hello, Broderick. Glad to see you. You too, King. Come on in, both of you. Dave, I don't know whether you've heard the news. About Martin's trial being scheduled for next week? Oh, you have heard it. Yeah. I I guess I'm not very brave, Sergeant Preston. I'll testify, but I'm going to be downright worried about what Martin's friends will do. They won't do anything, Dave. How'd you hear the news? Were you in town? No, I had a visitor this afternoon. Who? The lawyer, Henry Baker. He came here? What do you want? He suggested that it might be healthy if I'd clear out before the trial. Plan to? No. Martin's a rotten killer. He's got to be convicted. If it can't be done without my testimony, it'll be done with my testimony. Broderick, take my word for it. Nothing's going to happen to you. I'm taking measures to protect you both before and after the trial. I don't know, Sergeant. Lawyer Baker will do anything to get Martin an acquittal. That's why I came here today. I want to make sure he doesn't get the chance to do anything. Huh? I want you to go into hiding, Dave. Hiding? I've made the arrangements. You uh, know Maggie Sims, don't you? Good old Maggie, sure thing. Her place is just about half a mile from here toward town. I stopped to see her on the way here. She'll be looking for you. You're to go there right away and stay until I call for you on the day of the trial. You, Maggie, and I are the only ones who'll know where you are. But, Sergeant, I... I'm going to stay here in your place. For what? To see what happens. You think something will happen? I don't know, Dave, but I'm going to find out. <laughs> I guess I get no choice in the matter. Well, I hope you'll cooperate. <laughs> All right, I'll cooperate. You want me to go to Maggie Sims and lie low? Yes, and take your dog with him. All right. Make yourself at home. You'll find the larder well stocked, and there's plenty of stove wood in the shed. 
Say the word and I'll fix up before I leave. Think it out, Manny's thanks. I'd rather have you get to Maggie's place as soon as possible. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever been put out of my own house. But I'll take it without a murmur. <laughs> I'll clear out as soon as I get my parka. And, oh, say. Yes? Instead of melting snow for drinking water, I haul it from a good clear spring. Oh. There's plenty of it right over there in the corner, enough to last you all week. We'll make out, won't we, King? Oh, oh, oh. We'll continue our story in just a moment. I am thinking of something. Can you tell me what it is? Gee, are we going to play that small game again? Yeah, like we did the other day. Right, kids. Remember, you ask me questions. I'll answer right or wrong. And you see how quick you can guess just what it is I'm thinking of. Ready? Okay. Let's see. Is it something we all know about? Right, Billy. What I have in mind is really famous. Gee, would you be thinking again, like last time, of Quaker Pup Wheat and Quaker Pup Rice? No, but you're warm. Does it have anything to do with breakfast? It sure has. Mm, gosh, I'm stumped. Well, does it have anything to do with Quaker puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice? Right, Billy. You're really warm. In fact, you're getting hotter than a $2 pistol. Oh. <laughs> does it make a loud noise? That's a bang-up question, fella. You're right on the bullseye with both barrels. I got it. It's the gun that shoots Quaker puffed wheat. And Quaker puffed rice. Right you are, kids. Yes, I was thinking of the gun that shoots Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. The swell tasting, ready to serve breakfast cereals shot from gun. And fellas and girls, for a breakfast that helps you start the day with a bang, do this tomorrow morning. Treat yourselves to a heaping bowlful of delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice topped with milk and fruit. You need a good breakfast to help you through those long hours at school and play. And there's added food value, too, in Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Both delicious kinds have restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. What's more, these king-size kernels are shot through and through with bang-up nut-like flavor, too. They're crisp and tender. They're shot from guns, exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. Just make no mistake, wheat or rice shot from guns is never sold in bags or bulk. Ask for the big red and blue package with the famous smiling Quaker man on the front. That way you'll be sure of getting the one and only Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Now to continue our story. Sergeant Preston and King were alone in Dave Broderick's small cabin a few miles from the town of Dawson. I'll fill a pan with water for you, King. Then I'll see about some supper. <laughs> Sergeant Preston didn't know that the water had been drugged with a sleeping potion by Blackie Sneed, acting on instructions of the scheming lawyer, Henry Baker. There you are, fella. I'll start the coffee going, then we'll have a caribou steak. Well, what's the matter, King? Aren't you thirsty? Well, now, see here, boy, you can't complain about that water. It's supposed to be special. King held his nose close to the basin of water for the second time, then looked up at his master and whimpered softly. I don't understand you, King. You were looking at the snow just before we came inside. I'll taste it and see if I agree with you. Sergeant Preston dipped a cupful of water from the barrel and raised it to his lips. Hmm, strange does have an odd taste. I suppose it's all right, though. King, I, I guess we're just not used to good spring water. This will probably be all right in tea. I'll melt some snow for you. Sergeant Preston drank two cups of tea made with the drugged water. Then, soon after washing and putting away the dishes and utensils, he stretched out on the bunk and slept. It was a deep sleep. He didn't stir when King uttered a low growl in the middle of the night. The great dog knew that someone was prowling outside close to the house. He tried to rouse his master again. This was something King couldn't understand. Sergeant Preston had always wakened instantly at the slightest note of warning. King placed his big forefeet on the bed, gripped the Mountie by the shoulder, and shook him gently. The only response was a low snore. Then King's delicate nostrils caught the smell of smoke. It was seeping into the room between the side logs. 
smoke increased and the room became quite warm. Presently, small tongues of flame appeared. King knew what that meant. Fire. He redoubled his efforts to rouse the sleeping man. He pulled away the blanket, then pounced upon the bed. He tugged and pushed and rolled the Mountie to the floor. What? what what's the matter? King. King boy, what? Smoke, I... What's the matter with me? Oh, wait, King. Wait just a minute, boy. Don't drag me. I'm trying to get to my feet. Sergeant Preston's brain was whirling. He had a splitting headache. His arms and legs fell as if they were weighted with lead. He had to summon all his willpower to pick up his parka and drag himself to the door. All right, King. We'll get out, boy. Looks as if that lawyer's made his move against Dave Broderick. The cabin was doomed. There was nothing the Mountie could do to save it. He stood watching the fire for 10 or 15 minutes while the cold, crisp air dissipated the last effects of the drug. Then he and King went to the home of Maggie Sims. You mean to say my cabin's burning right now? Yes, Dave. Oh, how awful. I'm going to... But still, there's nothing you can do. It's the work of that sneaking polecat lawyer. That's what it is. You're probably right, Maggie. I've lost everything I own. We'll do something about that, Dave. Maybe if I'd been there myself, it wouldn't have happened. If you had been there, you would have died in the fire. Your drinking water was drugged. Drugged. I'd have died myself if King hadn't been on hand. Merciful goodness. I took your place, Dave, because I expected there'd be a move against you. There was a move, but unfortunately, I wasn't awake to catch the man who started the fire. It was either Baker or someone he sent. Probably Blackie Sneed. That's a good guess, but it's not proof that'll stand in court. Sergeant, what are you going to do? I want Dave to stay here just as we planned, Maggie. Let Baker think he perished in the fire. What good will that do? I don't know yet. But I'm going to think of some way to make Baker show his hand. Baker, the lawyer, was in his office at noon the following day when Blackie Sneed opened the door. Oh, come in, Blackie. Well, I suppose you heard about the fire last night. I heard about it. I didn't like what I heard, huh? What do you mean, Mr. Baker? Was Broderick inside when you started the fire? Inside? Well, sure. That is, I guess so. His dog was inside. I heard him barking. Did you stay around and watch to see that he didn't leave the cabin? Why, no, of course not. I figured that stuff I put in the water would fix him so he couldn't leave. You should have stayed to make sure. And get caught standing and watching the fire? Caught by whom? Oh, I don't know. Someone might have seen it and come to investigate. No one could see it. The cabin's too isolated. Well, gosh, boss, what's the matter? Why are you asking all these questions? There's been nobody found in the ruins. There hasn't. A traveler came into Dawson this morning, reported seeing the cabin. The remains were still smoking when Constable Drake went to investigate. He can't make a thorough search until tomorrow. Broderick must have been caught in a fire. If he got away, someone would have seen him. I hope you're right. The constable made inquiries at all the cabins between here and Broderick's place. No trace of him? No. And he hasn't appeared in Dawson. <laughs> He's dead, boss. I'm sure of it. A thorough search of the cold ashes gave no proof that Broderick had perished. There were several opinions concerning the fate of the missing man. Well, if he thought the fire was an attempt on his life, he, he might have run away. Yeah, and on the other hand, he might have got out of the cabin and uh, then collapsed where the wolves could find him. I say you're both wrong. I figure it this way. Dave didn't want to give testimony in court. He was afraid of what might happen to him. So he started his own cabin of fire and lit out for other parts. Well, maybe so. That's food for thought. I say it's a fool idea. It ain't like Dave to run away. Baker gained confidence as time went on. With the trial just two days off, he went to the jail to confer with his client. The constable had locked him in Martin's cell. I just wanted to tell you, Martin... I don't think you have a thing to worry about. You better make sure of that, Baker. If that jury finds me guilty, I'll tell plenty about you. Don't threaten me. I'm not making threats. I'm just stating facts. I'll tell about a few of your crooked deals. I'll tell about some of the things you've done to get acquittals for your clients. Shut up! I'll... Constable will hear you. He's at his desk in the other room. Just remember what I said. I paid your price, and I expect you to get me out. All right. I'll visit you again tomorrow. Constable! Constable Drake, I'm ready to leave. All right, Mr. Baker. Sorry I had to lock you in, but that's the law. That's all right. Uh, by the way, if you're not in a hurry to leave here, would you mind sitting at my desk for 15 minutes or so? Not at all. Why? I've got to go over to the newspaper office and see about some handbills. I don't want to leave the office alone. Go ahead, Drake. I'll wait until you come back. I guess I can trust you not to let the prisoner escape. <laughs> You'll be here when you get back. Thanks. <laughs> hey, Baker. 
you're not dead sure to get me acquitted, this would be a good time to unlock this door and let me out. Don't be a fool, Martin. That may be the very thing they want me to do. What do you mean? Sergeant Preston is still in Dawson. He's going to stay here until after the trial. He knows the law can't get a conviction with a star witness gone. Now, he'd like nothing better than to catch me aiding and abetting the jailbreak of a man who's on trial for murder. <laughs> in fact, I think that's exactly what he's planning on. Yeah? Yeah. Sounded pretty thin when the constable said he was going to see about some handbills. Why didn't he wait until his jailer got back? This constable office? Yes, this is the constable's office. What do you want, Indian? Me. Me run a long way. Bring message. Message for whom? Message for law. Me on trail when old woman call. Give message. Ask White Crow bring here. All right, I'll take it. She say law give dollar. Maybe two. Well, I'm not the one who pay... Just a minute. You going to stay here in Dawson? No, no good. Me on way south. Good hunting. Meet friends. All right. Here's your dollar. In fact, here's two dollars. Uh, now you go on your way. Good medicine. On your way. Oh, Yes, I have. I found the missing witness. Dave Broderick? Yes, he wrote this note. He says he can't give all the facts. He just wants the constable to know that he's safe and that he'll be on hand to testify at the trial. But that he can't leave Maggie Sims' cabin for another day or so. Oh, he's hurt, eh? Yeah, probably. Chances are he escaped from the fire and got lost in the snow or the woods. How'd he get to Maggie Sims' place? He doesn't say. Listen, Baker, you'd better do something. If he appears at the trial, I'm through, and so are you. Don't you say a word about this, Martin. Do you understand? Don't say a word when the constable comes back. You just leave this to me. I'll take care of Broderick. Soon after leaving the office of the constable, the attorney found Blackie Sneed in the cafe. And once more, he held a conference in the privacy of a back room. That's what you've got to do, Blackie. You better take care of it tonight. Did the Indian who brought that message leave town? Yes, I watched him go. Who else knows Broderick's alive? Maggie Sims and, of course, Martin. That's all. Okay. Don't worry, boss. I'll take care of things. Tonight? Tonight. But there's just one thing, Mr. Baker. Hmm? What's that? He went to a lot of trouble to get rid of Broderick in the fire so as no one would suspect a murder. I'd hope to avoid suspicion. But now I guess that's impossible. Now, here, I'll give you some money. You take care of Broderick. And if necessary, Maggie Sims. And then keep going. Don't come back to Dawson. That night, the wind howled around the small dark cabin where old Maggie Sims had made her home for many years. Blackie halted his dog team and heavily loaded sled in the shelter of some trees not far from the house. Holding a gun in readiness, he went to the cabin on foot. This door is unlocked. It should be. Which room he's in. I'll try this door first. If that old woman yells, I'll have to let her have it. The door opened into a small, dark room. The meager nightlight coming through the window revealed a bed near one wall. The figure on the bed was snoring softly. It must be Broderick. matter whether it is or not. Both he and the old woman have got to go. The prowler shifted his gun to the left hand, then drew a long knife from inside his boot. He held it over the mound beneath the bedclothes, then plunged it down hard. Get there! Leave the knife right there! Hey, what the... For an instant, Blackie stood spellbound. The voice came from beyond the bed, and a dark form rose in the narrow space between the bed and the wall. I'll get you! Take him, King! Get him! King had leaped from the doorway, and the full weight of his charge had struck Blackie in the middle of the back, driving him forward off balance. As his gun exploded, the bullet drilled into the wall. Then Sergeant Preston leaped across the bed and grabbed the gun hand. All right, King, get back, boy. I have him, fella. Bring a light, Dave. Are you all right? Are you all right, Sergeant Preston? Let me go. Who are you? What is this? Come on, I'll take that gun. Then you can stand up. Here's a light. Did it work, Sergeant Preston? That knife stuck through the bedclothes into the dummy we rigged up is your answer, Maggie. It's a frame-up. You set that note and let Baker get a hold of it just to trick him. We had to make him show his hand. Broderick, you're, you're all right. You're, you're not hurt. Who said I was? After Martin's convicted and sent to the hangman, there'll be another trial, Blackie. 
your trial for attempted murder. But yours will be different from Martin's. You'll have a chance to escape the hangman. I, I don't want to hang. I, I don't want to hang, I tell you. Listen, Preston, give me a chance. You have just one chance, Blackie, and that's to turn Queen's evidence. A jury might be lenient with you in view of the fact that no one died as a result of your two attempts at murder. You're the one who set fire to my cabin. You tried to kill me then. I, uh, who hired you? You know who hired me, Preston. You know it as well as I do. Baker? Yes. All right, Blackie, you've turned squealer. Now go all the way. It was Baker who hired me. You mean to say he'd go as far as murder to protect a rat like Killer Martin? He had to. He's afraid of what Martin will say if, if he gets convicted. Martin knows too much about Baker. He knows enough to put Baker in jail a dozen times over. He knows the things Baker did to get other crooks freed. We'll prepare a full and complete statement for you to sign, Blackie. Dave. You'd better come to Dawson with me when we have that statement. Whatever you say, Sergeant. We'll see that Baker makes arrangements to pay for the loss of your cabin, Dave. And we'll put him in jail with Blackie and Martin. Sakes alive, that jail will be downright crowded with all of them three crooks together. (laughs) Well, you can blame King for that, Maggie. Two of the crooks are there because he prevented the death of Sergeant Preston when my cabin burned. (laughs) King sure did a good job. Yes, boy. (laughs) Dave's talking about you. (laughs) Yeah, that dog. Many crooks have said that, Blackie, and in just the same tone of voice. And each time King hears it, he says to himself, this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Say, if you can't make up your mind which you like best, Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice... Here's what you do. Don't miss out on either of these delicious, ready-to-serve breakfast cereals. Keep a supply of both kinds on hand. Eat Quaker puffed wheat one time, Quaker puffed rice the next. Wheat or rice shot from guns is never sold in bags or bulk. Look for the big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Get the original, crisp, fresh Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle and directed by Fred Flowerday. This story was written by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King... Meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the bear trap. The bear trap was set and hidden beneath the freshly fallen snow. The little girl was running straight toward it, and King knew he must stop her. He did. And his reward was a bullet in the chest. It was a close thing. I was afraid that King would never hit the trail again. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. Boys and girls, who owns the best-looking dog in your neighborhood? Whose dog is always at his master's side? Well, I'll bet he eats kennel ration because feeding a dog kennel ration is mighty swell. Kennel ration is made with choice cuts of U.S. government-inspected horse meat and packed with vitamins and minerals. So start feeding your dog kennel ration today and watch for a thick, glossy coat, clear, bright eyes, and a playful, happy disposition. Have Mom get kennel ration at her favorite dealer today. Kennel ration, first in canned dog food. This is Jay Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pup Wheat and...